Next up, uh, we have James Lewis. His talk is Preserving History with KiCad. James, a.k.a. the bald engineer for... Uh, I have no idea why. He has a uh, background <laughs> in electrical engineering and is a teacher at heart. I know this because I've talked to him this weekend. If you have uh, read a tutorial on his blog or watched a video on his Ad Ohms YouTube channel, uh, he is also a frequent contribu contributor to Element 14 and Hackster, Hackster.io. As a fan of making things blink, beep, and fly, KiCad is a staple in his electronics toolkit. Welcome, James. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> As I often like to do, I'm going to start with a little bit of a story. Uh, about a year ago, I got an idea for a project, which led to an idea for another project, which then ultimately led to an idea for another project which was thought of right before, or I'm sorry, right after Chris said, hey, we're gonna do a conference called KaiCon. So the project that started this idea is, was a portable Apple II. And so I'll leave it up to you guys to figure out where I got the idea to make a video about a portable classic um, gaming or computer system. But one that I wanted to tackle was the Apple II. And the challenge is, this is the logic board from the original. And if you notice, there's about 88 uh, ICs on the board. And so as I look at this, it kind of turns out that's about as small as you can make that board, other than take the slots out. So I got to thinking, maybe this project's dead, and then something happened, and I brought it back. And I'll get to that in just a second. But first, I want to sort of go back to um, thinking about what was it like back in the late 70s, early 80s, with computers, right? Because what we, can, what we call and use as computers today is nothing like they were almost 50, 40 years ago. And so back in the 80s in the US, there was the Trinity, Apple, TR, um, uh, Tandy Radio Shack, and Commodore. And they really dominated most of the computer sales for almost a decade. Now I'm not trying to start a war about who was best or whatever, and I'm not trying to purposely avoid Atari, go read a couple books, they all call these three the Trinity, so that's where I'm coming from. And if you happen to be in the UK watching this, I didn't forget about Sinclair or even Dragon, I'm just saying, let's go back in time, here's where we were. Now, with all of these different types or various computers out there, there are hundreds of websites uh, blogs and podcasts dedicated to not only the companies that produce them, but the families of computers, and in some case, a single model. There is actually a podcast, an entire podcast on the Apple III. And so in terms of preserving the historic position of these computers, the internet's got that covered. Um, there's plenty of resources out there if you want to know anything about practically any classic retro or vintage computer. So if that's the case, then why am I here, right? Um, the reason is because I wanted to think about how do we preserve the schematics. And it actually turns out for just about every computer from this era, just like every other piece of electronics that was available, the schematics were generally shipped with the device. And so like, for example, in the Commodore 64, in the user manual, there was a copy of the schematic. So in that case, um, you might say, well, James, the schematics are preserved, in which case I would say thanks for the talk. I'll see you guys later. However, that's only part of the story. And so I got to tell you a couple things. Sorry. First of all, I've completely made up this picture. Uh, this is, in fact, a Commodore 64 schematic, but it did not come out of uh, the user manual. It came out of the programmer's manual, which is what's pictured here, because when I went to look for a picture of the user's manual, it looked like crap. So I picked that one. Um, oh, I'm sorry, no, I, it, I said user's manual and then I realized for the C64 it came out of the programmer's manual, um, I was going to use, it was the VIC-20 that it came with the owner's manual. Doesn't really matter, I just want to be correct that that's not, wh or that's where that came from, but it's not the user's manual. Now, when I first looked at this, I said, I'm going to be really clever and I'm going to use OpenCV to basically uh, OCR this and create a schematic out of it. And I thought that would be fantastic, right? Um, and in fact, I thought that'd make a really great talk for a conference like this. And then I found this copy of the Commodore 64 schematic. Um, it's literally the same schematic, except this one is now hand-drawn. 
And it's actually not the same schematic because, as often happens with electronics, there are about um, a dozen revisions of the Commodore 64 mainboard. And with that, there are six to eight versions of the schematics, which, as this one is an example of, only came out of the uh, repair manual. So the good news is these exist. The bad news is there are wildly ver wild variations in the way that they were created, printed versus hand-drawn. There are differences in the um, conventions used within the schematics. And then later, you're going to see some pictures where I mean, it's hard to read it as a human, so the idea that a computer is going to be able to read it isn't possible. So I just want to say, spoiler alert, I'm not going to open up a command window and type a command and get a schematic symbol or a KiCad um, schematic file out of a PDF. But I will talk to you about what I'm doing and how we're going to get to what I want. But first, I want to come back to this Apple II because when I initially was thinking about how do I build a portable of this, as I said, there's 88 chips on this board. And so I started looking a little bit deeper into it. And really, if you look at it, there's a CPU, RAM, ROM, and a whole bunch of support logic, which I would like to just point out that you know this was something, this was one of the last computers that Wozniak pretty much designed on his own. And I think it's pretty amazing that he was able to do this with entirely off-the-shelf parts. There are no custom chips in the original Apple II. Great for him, super awesome, super proud. Uh, but I had the goal of building a portable Apple II using vintage hardware, and I'm no Steve Wozniak. So if that's the best he could do, there's nothing I can do. So I only point that out because, yeah, I could use an FPGA or a CPLD and basically reproduce it, but that would be cheating. I want to use vintage hardware. So I don't know if you guys have ever done this. You know, you have a couple of glasses of wine, maybe a beer. You go on eBay and start typing in random things that you might want to buy. I did it one time in my life, and I ended up with an Apple IIe motherboard because it didn't occur to me until I did this presentation, I could just go find a picture of it on Google, that this was the first, and by the way, I got the IIe because if uh, the, the, the original Apple II motherboard is ridiculously expensive. If anyone has one and wants to donate it to my cause, I'd be okay with that. The key on this one, though, is as we start to look at it, there are actually now ASICs that are included in the design. And so this is functionally compatible with the previous generation, but the number of chips has been significantly reduced. And so then I started thinking, hey, this is good news. Maybe I can build something out of that. And then I found the logic board for the Apple IIc, which is the most integrated Apple II that came out. In fact, there's a disk drive built into it. It would actually be sitting right here. Now, I didn't highlight all the chips on this one, and in fact, I only highlighted this one here because I think it's kind of cool. It's the IWM, it's the integrated WAS machine, which is the original Apple II disk controller that, guess who, Steve Wozniak designed. And just FYI, Apple, he had a card that controlled the disk drive. Commodore went the route of, they put a 6502 RAM and ROM into their disk drive and made it a computer just as powerful as the C64. So again, not trying to... Well, actually, I am trying to say Wozniak was a freaking genius because he did it with a state machine and eight chips. So <clears throat> anyway, this got me really excited because if I could harvest this chip into my portable two Apple design, then I could use an SD emulator to load disk images with it because now I have a way to access a, quote, disk drive. So, and I promise this will be the last computer I show you. Then I found the Apple II GS. And I shouldn't say I found it. I knew about this in elementary school because I thought it was the coolest computer ever. And I still think it's the coolest 8 slash 16-bit computer ever. A couple of things to know about it. It's a 16-bit architecture. It supported up to 8 megabytes of RAM. It originally shipped with one. And it supported 4,096 colors. Now, remember back in the 80s, the number of colors a com computer could display was actually a really big deal. Um, the thing that gets me is this came out in 1986. It had a full-color, mouse-driven graphical operating system that was in color. Remember the Apple Macintosh? It came out in 1984, and it had a two-color graphical operating system. It took them like five years to catch up to what these guys had done actually before the Mac. So just saying. Now, all of that's really cool, but the thing that caught my attention with the 2GS is it was 100 or nearly 100% backward compatible with an Apple II. 
And that got me thinking, well, what the hell did these guys do in 1986 that allowed them to fully emulate a 10-year-old computer? Well, here's the motherboard for this one. And the only reason I'm showing you without highlights first is this is actually 1986, and there's already surface mount components that are readily in use on this board, which I thought was kind of cool. So blue are off-the-shelf chips. Orange are ASICs. One cool thing is in the course of 10 years, we went from 88 off-the-shelf parts to 20 chips or so, 10 of which were entirely custom. Now, though, there's two sections on this board I really want to draw attention to. There's three sets of RAM. There's something called fast RAM. And then this RAM is actually for the sound chip because it could play digitized samples. And then this down here in software is called slow RAM, but on this motherboard it's called standard RAM. This is the RAM for the chip called the Mega 2. Now, this is not a precursor to the Arduino. The Mega 2 is an ASIC that when I read it in the te technical manual, said it completely emulates a, it, what did it say? It completely integrates all of the hardware from the Apple II on a single chip. So then I had my aha moment. I'm like, hell, if I could just get this one chip, I can make my portable Apple II, it'll be really small, and then bent, and this inspiration that I have will be jealous because of what I pulled off. Of course, that's not the full story. So here's the chip. Here's that Apple II logic board, and I'm going to gray out the chips that it does not emulate. It doesn't emulate RAM, ROM, or the CPU. So it's actually just the support logic for the Apple II. So you still need like six other chips to make it functional. So I'll still need a processor, the RAM, the ROM, the Mega II. I'm thinking about at this point using the video controller that's in the 2GS because it outputs RGB, which will make it really easy to get it into an LCD. And then I'm going to add the WAS, uh, the WAS controller so I can do disk drive. The thing I haven't figured out yet is what I'm going to do about the keyboard because after the 2E, all Apples used a, um, used a dedicated microcontroller for keyboard. And so I might cheat and make that a modern like um, AT Mega based something just to make life easier. So here I am, I've got, I've got hope now. I know I can, or I think I can make my portable computer using these blocks. Then I started thinking, okay, I'll just go, I'll just go search uh, Google and I'll download the library for Apple II GS components and I can start drawing a circuit board, right? Well, obviously they don't exist. And so let's come back to the original idea of, well, what about this schematic that exists out there? If there's PDFs of all of these computers and all of these logic boards, isn't that good enough to go off and do something with? Well, let me make one comment before I bash the fact that these exist. I'm really glad that they're available. Um, it's better than having no information. But think about it for a second. This is the highest quality version I can find of this schematic. So even if I was clever enough to write some Python that could turn this into something, I don't, I, and I could be wrong, and I would love for somebody to prove me wrong, I don't think it's going to be able to decode what the names of some of these labels are. And so if it can't do that, then what can we do? So like I said earlier, it turned out, or what I decided on is, I'm just going to have to recreate these by hand. Now that I've done some of this work, one thought that I never occurred to me is, these schematics are 30 to 40 years old. The styles and conventions used 40 years ago are a lot different than they are today. So um, I could have just said, well, I'm going to use KiCad and move forward. Instead, I decided if I'm going to embark upon this project of recreating and archiving these schematics in a modern, usable format, what are some of the things we would look for in a package? And then make a decision based on that, which I'm sure at this point you guys have no idea which one I decided to go with. So first, it has to be cross-platform, right? I think even in this room, we probably could identify somebody that uses one of these three operating systems. So in terms of creating the schematics, cross-platform doesn't matter. But in terms of being able to, say, download the TR TRS-80 Model 1 schematic and figure out where the clocks are routed, you just need to be able to install something, see where they're at, move on. So cross-platform is important. Next is file formats. And after, after yesterday, I thought I was going to have to harp on this a lot more, but it's pretty clear that 
open file formats are critical. Uh, being able to read the file formats are critical. And so one comment I'll make here is even if this proprietary format, and I'm just picking on brand A for no, no reason other than why not. Um, actually, I'm going to, never mind. Um, pick it on for no reason, is 20 years from now, I want to make sure we can actually read these file formats. There, are, there, there is software from the 80s that we have disks of that we cannot access because they're copy protected. And, you know, eventually, sure, somebody's going to crack it and we can run it. Or you have the other problem of you have to run a cracked version of the software in order to use it with anything modern, either an emulator or, or a disk emulator. And that, you know, that's questionable. So open file formats are important because 20 years from now, you may want to be able to read these and do something with it. Next is long-term support. And as a product manager, I'm very familiar with this curve where you say a product becomes, it grows as it's, after it's introduced and then eventually it declines. As consumers, we all hope that as a product declines, that the company that produces it will, will graciously put it into the public domain so that we can continue to enjoy it. I think we can all count on one hand how many times that happens. And so one comment I want to make is open source does not guarantee long-term support. However, the barrier to it happening is significantly reduced once the source code's out there and available. Right, 20 years from now, we'll probably be able to download the KiCad 5.1 binary and run it on something. I can't say the same for some commercial software. And then next is uh, accessibility. Uh, I don't mean in terms of physical accessibility. I mean how open is a platform to somebody to pick up and use. So first thing to always consider is cost. If something's really expensive, it, prohibit it prohibits who can use it. Now again, just because it's open source doesn't make it the best thing ever, but it does enable a really low cost barrier, right? Next is usability. The thing's got to be usable. I don't think I have to say much about that. And then in terms of capability, you, you need to have software that can actually accomplish the tasks that you want. Um, I have a strong belief. I do like open source software, but I don't always use it. I use the tools that fit the job and work the best. That's what these three elements of accessibility means. Um, if you have a program that is really good at drawing vectors but not schematics, that doesn't fit. Scripting is important. Um, ULP is great as long as you're using Eagle. But I don't know about you guys. I'm tired of learning new, uh, new programming languages. So anything that supports Python sounds like a better job to me or sounds like a better fit for me. And then last, even though the project I'm kicking off is all about the schematics, um, my personal project, the Portable Apple II, I'm going to have to make a PCB one day. And, you know, I firmly believe that auto routers are really important and that you should have an auto router with, yeah, I hate them, so. I just wanted to throw that out there. I, I don't care about auto routers. Um, obviously, it came down to KiCad's the best option, right? You look at all of those attributes, there's really nothing else that fits into this category. Um, and by the way, I did originally plan to put an eagle screenshot there, but I don't think I control you t two times in a row. So where am I at? Um, what I started doing is I have actually been streaming on Twitch the work that I'm doing to create this. And I mentioned that because if you're new to KiCad and you're trying to think about, well, how do you use this thing? What could we do with it? Um, if you'd like to watch me use it, feel free. Uh, the chat has no problem let letting me know everything I'm doing wrong. So you can learn from my mistakes. Um, here's where I'm at. I've created a library that includes all of the ASICs that we saw on that original, uh, on the Apple IIGS motherboard. Um, now this is an area where, uh, thinking back, I wish I had thought more, more in terms of programming and less in terms of brute force. Because as I learned yesterday, I could have actually probably generated most of these symbols by creating a table and then just having, um, having a, a script spit out the, the parts. So I think when I go to do the next system, that's how I'll get the ASICs for that. Um, Multi-level uh, KiCad schematic. Uh, this was actually the first time I ever created one of these. I didn't realize how easy it is. Uh, and I, at first I thought it was kind of weird that it uses a separate file for each. But then as I started using Git, I'm really glad it uses a separate file for each. Um, of the nine pages of the 2GS schematic, I've created four of them. Uh, it, once, once most of the work is done, it's pretty easy. Now, 
This does bring me to the fourth page, and the last time I'll say why I, I couldn't come up with an automated way to do this. Here's the seven slots of the 2GS. And what you might think just at a glance, if you look at this, you might say, oh, these are all on a bus and all the pins are connected together and go to a common set of uh, signals. And in a world where your only way to read a schematic is on paper, this is probably the most efficient way to communicate how things are connected across a page like this. But in a world where everybody has a computer on their bench, um, if not more than one, this is a very difficult way to read a schematic. And so just to point this out, uh, slot seven is actually the only slot that goes to a completely different enable pin from the other six slots. Um, it's not a big deal in terms of what I'm ultimately doing, but the way I look at this is if I just glanced at this schematic, I would have made a mistake and said, oh, it's clearly the same. What I prefer is using pin labels for something like this, because then I can do two things. I can either search for it, whether it's in KiCad or if it's in a PDF, uh, and then the other one is I can use Highlight Net to see where it goes. And so in this case, I don't think it makes sense to run this bus all over the place because it actually makes it more difficult to read, but that's not always going to be the case. So this is another reason I started thinking about, well, you know what, an automated tool, if all it did was recreate the schematic, is that really any better than just having a PDF version of it? Instead, why not recreate it with the mindset of using it with a modern tool? And then this one, so this last one, I, I, I had hoped to have something by the time of the conference, but I want to throw this one out there to see if anyone can help out. So just like the, the FPGA schematic that Dave showed us yesterday morning, there's one page dedicated to decoupling capacitors. Now, I could just go through and copy paste and make that happen, but I'm wondering if anyone has ideas on a tool or script we could write to do something like this. And then this leads me to the idea of, are there sections or bits of this process that could be automated that would ultimately make it go faster? Maybe it doesn't have to be a holistic, oh, in, in goes PDF outcomes schematic file. Um, so I'm open to those ideas as well. So if you'd like to help out, I've created a GitHub repository, which is full of a whole bunch of blank directories, which I hope by the next time we come together won't be so blank. Um, one that I have filled in is the Apple II. Uh, as I said, that's the one I'm working on now. Um, and here's the general process I see happening with this. So go to the repository, pick a system you want to help out with. Um, I haven't populated it yet, but I'm going to provide links to all of the systems that I know have PDFs existing somewhere, just to kind of take that step out of the process. Do some capture, submit a re uh, revision of it. We'll kind of go through some process here. Eventually we'll say, hey, looks like it's good. I'd also like ideas on, um, any thoughts on how we get people to verify that these things are actually correct. Um, you know, if take the Commodore example. They printed the schematic one time when the machine was produced, and then they made like 10 revisions of the PCB. So the schematic will not actually match most of the Commodores that are in the world. So how do we verify that the schematic we have actually fits or matches the hardware? Um, other than a whole bunch of probing, I haven't thought of a good way to handle that. And then we'll publish it. And then something else I'm thinking about too is this whole like development process, is there a better tool than GitHub to, uh, to, use, to use there? Um, you know, it, it's pretty clear for PCBs Git is a mess, but schematics, maybe not so bad. So if you'd like to help out, come find me. Uh, you can download slides at this place. You can s join the project here. You can find me at those places. Any questions?